Hi, my name is Mark and I am a non-practicing addict alcoholic and I was a hardcore user, heroin, alcohol, any drug you can think of for about almost 11 years. And thanks to the things I've learned and the things I learned early on in my recovery, I have been clean and sober for over 30 years. And my story began at about 10 years old. I turned 10 on May 4th of 1969 and my mother, who I was very close to, died unexpectedly six days after my 10th birthday and she died the day before Mother's Day. And if you can imagine, uh, 1969 was a crazy time. The Vietnam War was going on and every night on the TV you'd see the action of Vietnam and it was a scary thing. The year before in 1968 Martin Luther King ha Jr. had been assassinated. Bobby Kennedy, JFK's brother, had been assassinated. Uh, there were all kinds of protests going on and it was a really scary world to be in as a 10 year old boy. And then when my mother died, who was very close to me and was very kind to me, it broke my heart and it scared me because my father was a very difficult man and he had a hard time dealing with her death and he had a violent temper and uh, was not always the kindest in his words. He always told me when I was growing up that I was the dumbest of his five kids. I was stupid, never amount to anything. And I set out to prove that right when I was using drugs, apparently. So after my mom died uh, at 10, my older brother hung around some hippies, you know, back in 1969. And he would take me around to these parties and they'd get me stoned and get me drunk and think it was funny and cute. And uh, back then, a, a, an associate of the Hells Angels, a friend of my brother's, gave me some LSD. So I did my first acid when I was 10. And over time, I did about every drug you can think of. By the time I was 14, I did my first heroin at 14, and I, I absolutely loved it. And as you can imagine, living in a scary time, in a scary home, uh, and with all the insecurities of a 10-year-old, drugs and alcohol took my pain away, it made me feel better, made me feel good, and it became my way of dealing with life. So I used drugs and alcohol to deal with everything. I learned to use it to boost my confidence, to, to give me the you know, fake confidence, the, the stuff I didn't really have by nature. It dealt with my pain whenever a problem came up, I just use and took the pain away. And it worked for a while, as you know, if you've been experienced this as well, but eventually it stopped working. And when I was 20 years old, I was on the streets, I was ninth grade dropout, and hopelessly addicted. I went into treatment my first time then, and in treatment they told us that we had about a 5% chance of being straight within a year from that time. And so they were saying, really what they were saying is, you have a 95% chance of failure. And that, that hit me hard, I was like, wow, you know, I've been through all this, and I'm tired, I'm sick and tired of being tired, now you're just telling me I have a 95% chance that I'm gonna be straight a year from now? Why would you tell me that? And it ticked me off. And unfortunately, they were right, because within three months of getting out of treatment, I was using again. About a year later, I went back to treatment, and I heard them say the same thing again. They said, you have about a 5% chance of being straight one year from now. And this is when something changed for me. In my mind, I thought, I wonder what the 5% do differently than the 95%. They, they must be doing something differently because why would they be able to succeed and everybody else not? And so I started hunting down people who'd been sober for 10, 20, 30 years and asking them what they were doing. And, and I found out that, wow, the things they were doing and the way they looked at addiction and recovery was way different than the 95% or the way I had been looking at it. For one thing, they accepted fully that they were addicts and, or alcoholics and that they could never use ever again without severe consequences. The rest of us, the 95%, we were always thinking in the back of my mind, eh, maybe I'm an addict, maybe I'm not. Or we were thinking, you know, well, maybe I'll get better, maybe I can handle it, maybe I can just be a partial addict and be able to control it. And we were always looking for and having that hope in our mind that we could still use somehow. That's a real sign of addiction. And those guys, those 5%, no, they knew it. They knew they 
knew they were added, uh, addicted and they knew that they couldn't use without consequences. They also practice all 12 of the steps. Most of the 95% of the group I was in, we didn't. We maybe tried a few of the steps, maybe some of us got to step four, maybe some to five, uh, but I hadn't met anybody that practiced all 12 and ongoing, right? So this 5% group practiced the 12 steps initially, but kept practicing them ongoing as a way of life, as a way of dealing with life. And so I found that interesting. And so I decided, well, I'm gonna do what the 5% do, and I'll, I'm an addict, I'm an alcoholic, I can tell from the history I got a problem, and I just have to accept I can't do it. I've gotta push it out of my life, and once I accepted that, and that I needed to work all 12 steps on an ongoing basis, and follow what they did. I, I, they also did a couple other things. They didn't hang around the same old bars. They didn't hang around bars at all. They didn't hang around the old friends. They didn't hang around even family members if it put them in jeopardy. They, they changed their behavior. They changed their friends. They changed their environment. And the 95% of us were always doing the things we shouldn't do. We were always going back to the old bar, just hanging out, seeing some of the old friends, just see how they're doing, you know, I'm not gonna, fall into the old trap and we would fall into the old trap. So again, I followed the 5% and I've been clean and sober ever since. I've been clean and sober for over 30 years and I used hardcore for 10 years. In fact, you know, I was I was homeless and, and in bad shape when I started to get sober. So I'm going to share with you the things that I've learned over time and uh, this 5% rule really was a gem for me because I found out that it not only applied to recovery uh, of addictions, but it also applies to everything else. I found out the same with relationships. If I learned what successful relationships were like, people who were in those, how they thought about it, how they addressed things, how the actions they took, I could have a good relationship too. And lo and behold, that's worked. I have had a 26 year marriage to my one and only wife. Same with fitness or health. So the 5% rule applies to everything. You know, if you want to be successful at anything and get past your addiction and move on to the things you know you're capable of, you just have to find out, and there's plenty of books on how to be successful on anything, and follow those steps, follow the things that successful people do. Uh, today, I'm a published author. I am a successful executive for a large corporation. I have a successful marriage. I've done so many cool things. I'm an award-winning speaker, and I've done a lot of fun stuff. And that would never have happened uh, if I stayed on the old track. I'd be dead by now, I'm certain of it. So I want to share with you what I've learned about addiction and why we get stuck in the trap and what we can do to break out of the trap and what it's going to take. I'm not going to you know, sugarcoat anything. Uh, so I want to help you to learn what I've learned and I'm really hopeful that it will click some things inside of your mind like these things have clicked in my mind and they didn't always click instantly but once I got them it really made a big difference and it's allowed me to enjoy the life that I never could have imagined or dreamed of before because I was so far down. I was always told I was the dumbest kid of my dad's five children. I was the stupidest. I'd never amount to anything. Um, and so here I am, the most successful of the five children now, and long-term successful. And today, uh, I'll be honest with you, I, drinking and drugging is not an issue for me, you know, thank God, because I still practice the steps regularly. And so when I have to get around stuff, it doesn't, it's not an urge like it was because I've been develop this new habit of, of living life in a right way and I know that I cannot use ever again without consequences and I don't want to throw away everything that I've gained and, and been blessed with over the years. So that's my story and uh, we're going to get into some videos or some additions to this video that will help you understand why we get addicted and what we can do to get out of that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about why we get stuck in addiction and why it's so hard to break that pattern of addiction and why it really it just seems to have such a huge hold on us. And so to, to really illustrate why it's so powerful and strong, I'm going to really I'm going to show you the, the human mind model. This is the model of what the human mind is like and why we get trapped. So first off, this below this line is 
like a ship. It's our subconscious mind. And your subconscious mind is the most powerful part of your mind. So if we look at the subconscious mind and the conscious mind, the conscious mind is the part of you right now that's watching me in this video. You've seen the first part of this video, now you're looking at this, you're trying to figure out who is this guy, is he for real, all the stuff, whatever's going through your mind. And so that's your conscious mind, and that, that's your reasoning and logic. But at the same time, your subconscious mind is taking in millions of bits of information. In other words, your subconscious mind knows if there's a spot on the wall over down in that corner, or if there's a stain on the carpet over down here, or if there's a, some abnormality on the ceiling, or how many ceiling tiles are there. Your subconscious mind takes in millions of bits of information, but all that gets filtered out because your conscious mind only focuses on what you're consciously thinking about and aware of. For example, if you were going home or walking outside somewhere and, and a robbery took place today uh, and the police came and they wanted to find out what you knew about the robbery, you know, so let's say you're participating and helping, um, that, that uh, they'll ask, you know, what was the license plate number, what was the color of the car, what did the people look like? At a conscious level, you'll remember some of the details. However, if you're able to go into a deep state of hypnosis in your subconscious mind, a skilled hypnotist could get down and you would probably remember the license plate number. You'd probably remember more details about the people themselves and nuances, uh, strange things that they did. So your subconscious mind is the most powerful part of your body or your being. And it's said, as an example, that your conscious mind only operates about 10% of you and 90% of what's operating you is at the subconscious or other than conscious mind level. Your subconscious or other than conscious mind also controls your heartbeat, your blood th flow throughout all your body. Your, it, it participates in the healing process. If you have a cut on your hand and it heals after a few days or a week, that's all done through the subconscious level of your mind. So subconscious is really powerful, that's the main point. Unfortunately, we take in all this subconscious stuff throughout our life. When I was uh, 10 years old, I got a lot of subconscious messages. The subconscious me messages were from watching the Vietnam War and the assassinations of uh, Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. and the worry about the Cold War back then. We still were worried about the Cold War with uh, Russia. The subconscious messages I was getting growing up is, this is a scary world. This is a scary, dangerous world. And the subconscious messages I got about drugs and alcohol in the gang that I hung out with was that this stuff is good. If everybody did drugs and alcohol, everybody would be happy. The life would be great. And that was the subconscious message. And at a conscious level, when I tried stuff, I thought, wow, yeah, this works, you know? And so I got sucked into it. Subconsciously, we also develop strategies for dealing with life. And so it becomes like a ship that's on autopilot. We become, we have these automatic strategies. So to give you some examples, when my mom died, when my grandfather blew his brains out while we were visiting him, the strategies I had for dealing with these horrible life things were drugs and alcohol took away pain. That was my strategy. Whenever pain comes, drugs and alcohol take pain away. Or whenever I feel uncertain or not confident, drugs and alcohol make me feel confident. So that became my strategy. After I used them regularly enough for a while, it became habit because through repetition we develop habits. Then eventually it becomes so strong it becomes, there's impulses so that even when we don't have a problem or we don't need confidence boosting or whatever our issues are, we get the impulse to use without any apparent reason. We just get an impulse, man. We want to use, we want to drink, we want to drug. And then it eventually also physically affects us. So if you've ever been through withdrawals, you know it physically affects you, but it also physically affects you in the way that your body physically craves what you're addicted to. This is your ship. It's an autopilot thing and it's all started at the very subconscious level. You don't even think about it. So eventually we realize, hey, wow, you know, this life of using and uh, drugs, it's killing me, man. I hate this. I'm tired of banging my head against the wall. I would really like to, to learn what it's like to be free from that. So we decide to go to war with the subconscious mind. And what we use is our conscious mind. 
And so the 10% of conscious mind is now fighting against the 90% of our subconscious mind. And what we use are willpower, conscious thing, I'm gonna tough this out. We use our analytical ability, we look at it, we go, wow, you know, if I look at my life, drugs and alcohol are really bad for me, and uh, I wanna quit. And we reason out, you know, there's been some people who've been successful at this. I, I've met a few or heard of a few, and I, it seems pretty good. And they're, life seems better if they get off the stuff. And people who stay on it, if I look at all the people long term, what their life is like, it doesn't look as good, you know? So we get a war going against our autopilot ship. But then what happens is that any time a trigger sets off, and some of the four basic ones you've already learned about probably, are we get too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, it puts a halt to our war, and we jump right back in the ship of our old behavior. So your triggers, again, can be four of the biggies are too hungry, too angry, too lonely, or too tired. It can be anything. It really can be uh, a number of triggers that set you off. Uh, with, with eating, for me, for a long time, uh, my office is next to a break room and people would come in and bring snacks and all that. And, and I found that, man, if I went to go get coffee or a drink of water, wow, food right there, seems like I should probably eat it. And it was really easy to put myself in that environment. So I finally decided, well, I'm just not gonna go to that break room. I go down the hall to a different area where there's not as much stuff available all the time. And so I changed that habit. But whenever I would walk into that same old break room, the habit was I would get hungry for something. So anything can be a trigger, uh, and identifying those triggers is important when we talk more about relapse prevention. So this is why we get stuck. We're using 10% of our mind's power against that very strong 90% of subconscious stuff. When we're aware of this, and we understand that that's what's happening, that is the first step to moving us in a better direction. So I hope this makes sense to you, and I hope it illustrates why we get caught up and why we automatically do the same thing, even though we know better, we fall back in the trap. And so in the next video, we're gonna talk about the things we need to do to quit this, to stop jumping back in that ship, and to build a new ship with new strategies, new habits that are healthier and good for us, and that our impulses will eventually become better for us, and our physical craving will be for good things. Uh, exercise, you know how people can actually get in the habit of exercise and eating right and drinking water. I used to hate water. Uh, now I really like water. So it's a matter of changing this ship so that when we have these difficulties in life or any other trigger, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, you know, tragedy, anything else, that we have a better ship to jump in, a better strategy that's healthier for us and enables us to take our ship wherever we want to go in life and live an extraordinary life instead of being stuck in a ship that keeps going around and around in the Bermuda Triangle of life. So I hope this makes sense and we'll talk more about relapse prevention in the next section. Okay, in the last video we talked about the human mind model and why we get stuck in old habits, behaviors that really have a lot of control over us because they're at a subconscious or other than conscious level. Our unconscious strategies, the habits we develop over time, the impulses we get after doing it so many times, and even the physiological or the physical addiction we have to old behaviors. And even when we try to fight it and go to war with our willpower, analytical ability, and reasoning, man, anytime a trigger comes up that we get too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, or any other trigger that, that we've set up in, in our lives of dealing with things, something sets us off, our response goes automatically back to that old ship, that old behavior. So in, to break through that, develop a new strategy, new habits, new uh, even building into new impulses to do it the right way and building into new physical uh, desire to do things the right way, we have to understand what's at the core of everything first and then we will talk about strategies and changing our behavior. So the real core issue is, is that we have human needs that need to be fulfilled. In order to be happy in life and to order to feel good, we have needs that need to be filled. And the basic human needs, I, I like uh, these particular six human needs that uh, they were 
introduced by Tony Robbins. He's a self-help guru guy. But there are many, many different human needs models. This one seems to make the most sense to me, and it really includes everything that you need to know. We all, in our lives, need some sort of certainty. We need to know where our next meal is coming from. We need to know that our family or somebody cares about us. We need to know that if we do certain things, we'll get certain results. We need some level of certainty. We also need variety. We need to have some fun we, because if we're, our life becomes too monotonous and boring, uh, you know, it's not cool. And so we like to have variety, some amount of fun and change. We all need some amount of significance. We need people to acknowledge us, to recognize that we're here and that we have some value. We need connection and love, connection with other people. And we need growth. We need to be expanding and improving and increasing our abilities or our knowledge because otherwise, again, life gets too static and boring. And we need to make some level of contribution. We need to have some kind of legacy where we feel like we've made a little bit of difference. Now, there are two ways to fulfill these human needs. And these are the things that drive all of our behavior. Unfortunately, there's two ways to fulfill those human needs. One's a really bad way, and the other way is a really good way that's effective. So in the really ineffective bad way is what I call the way of get. There's two ways of life, the way of get and the way of give. The way of get is really ineffective and it's very self-focused because we're always trying to get something for us to fill those needs. So in the way of get, we often think, man, if I only had $10 million, my life would be awesome. Unfortunately, most people who win a lottery, the vast majority who win a lottery, or even if uh, they didn't win a lottery, they got a large sum of money, they ruin it, blow it all in a short period of time because that's not what they really need. And in fact, they don't even know how to handle money. And so they blow it. So it doesn't fulfill them. They think, uh, man, if I just had this job or got this cool car or got this girlfriend or whatever it is they think they want, to fill these needs, they get it, and it doesn't fulfill for long. They get the thing they think they want, and they're like, wow, okay, well, that was kind of cool for about a second, and then they're off to the next thing, and it's just empty. And so the way of get doesn't fulfill you very long. The other thing to know about these human needs is that anytime you fill three or more at the same time doing an activity, it has a very powerful effect on you. So. In line with the way of the negative way of fulfilling needs, in drug and alcohol use, for me, drinking and drugging gave me certainty. If I wasn't feeling right, I knew if I drank or used drugs, I would get a feeling or it would take away pain. That was a certainty for me. Initially, it worked. Later on, it actually caused more trouble than it was worth. But initially, every time I knew my life sucks, if I do some pain relief, you know, feels good. Gave me some certainty. It also gave me variety. Man, I used all kinds of drugs and alcohol to, to solve my problems, and it gave me a, you know, a feeling of fun to go pursue it and all that. It gave me a sense of significance, because in the circles I hung around with, I had some pretty high connections with some pretty high dealers, and, and uh, so I was kind of a main you know, dude, so to speak, and uh, so it gave me some significance. Uh, connection was not really a real healthy connection. It was more like that's how I met people because I was, you know, I had this title, the significance of getting drugs for people. Uh, growth, I learned a lot back then about the different drugs that were available and, and how to get them. And so I had that kind of growth going on. And my contribution in my mind was that I was teaching people how to get high. And I thought that was a good thing. Unfortunately, when we deal in this selfish way, of trying to fulfill our needs, the outcomes are bad. Because if you've been in the in the, the drug world, you know the outcomes are bad. Same in the criminal world. In other words, if I want certainty, I can stick a gun to somebody's head. And I'm pretty sure the outcome of this thing, I'm going to get what I want. So it gives me certainty. It gives me a variety because there's a thrill and an excitement behind a criminal activity. It gives me significance, but man, I got the power. I got the gun. Power right on you, man. Uh, connection, I got a connection. It's called I got power over you connection when I got the gun in my hand. Uh, growth, and eh, maybe not so much. Contribution, maybe not so much, but it fulfills quite a few of them instantly with a gun. Don't even have to work at it. The sad thing is, is we all know deep down it's wrong. It's not right. And we all know that the outcome is not good. 
Because when we live in a criminal mindset or we live in the selfish, self-centered mindset of drugs and alcohol and we're trying to get these things to fulfill our needs, the outcomes are emptiness. Because as soon as we do the crime, as soon as we do the drug, do the alcohol, you know what? It wears off pretty quick. And we need to go fill those needs again because we're just not, it doesn't fulfill you. It's empty. It ends in tragedy. <laughs> How many people do you know who've gone to prison? How many people do you know who've died from drugs and alcohol? How many people do you know who've ruined their lives? How much have you ruined your life with all this stuff, right? It's tragic because there's something better inside of you. You just haven't found it yet or haven't developed it enough yet. It is there. And regret, that's the other thing that happens. Man, all through all this, when you come to your senses in those moments, you go, wow, you know, yeah. I, you just don't feel good about it. And dissatisfaction, your soul is dissatisfied continually. It never stays satisfied for long. You keep doing this stuff, and it's like banging your head against the wall. So this is the way of get to fill the needs. Doesn't work. And when you can step back away from it and look at it from a distance, like how I can look at it now, or anybody else who's you know picks up a newspaper and looks at all this these statistics, they go, wow, you know that's horrible, you know. And it is, it really is. When we're living in it, we don't see it so much because we're, we're kind of not in our right mindset, but you know it, you know that this is true. So then there's this other way of life that's so much more awesome. It's so, I don't know how to explain it because it doesn't even make sense. It's called the way of give. And so you can fulfill all these needs by living the way of give, which is really more powerful and has way better results. So the way of give is based on the effect and the fact that it's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about others. It's about how I can make a difference for other people. It's about how I can become the best mark that I can be, how you can become the best you that you can be, so that you can help and serve others and make a difference in life. No matter where you're starting from right now, there's things that are your experience, this, all this that you've been through is something that if you can get to this other side, you can help other people. You can make a huge difference, huge difference. So in my case, I began, you know, I got clean and sober and I began to learn about improving yourself, uh, learning uh, about self-growth, about serving others. And so now that's why I'm making this video. I'm trying to teach you guys things that will help you change your life. And the way of give is always fulfilling because it's not about you. The better I become and the better I serve and the more I serve others, the more fulfilled I am. If you meet anybody who is a giver by nature, they are just happy. And the reason they're happy is because they're not focused on them. They're focused on how they can make a difference, how they can really help and serve other people. And that is always fulfilling and deeply rich uh, flavor of life that, that it gives you. It makes you feel satisfied. You have real fulfillment. You have true pleasure, not false pleasure. You have gratitude and happiness for the things that you're able to contribute and do. And you feel satisfied. And so as I serve and help others and, and learn things of importance that help others and teach them to other people, I feel certainty because I know when I live the way of give, when I follow the 12 steps of AA, when I strive to be a better person, my life gets way better. I mean, far beyond what I ever could have imagined. Imagine. Variety, it gives me all kinds of variety. I'm learning all kinds of cool stuff in all levels of life that help m other people. Significance, other people think uh, I'm, I'm all that and more because of all the things I've accomplished, but I'm not trying to get that. I'm not trying to get significance. I've been given awards uh, for speaking. I've been given awards for my business practices. And it's not what I'm trying to get. It's what I'm trying to give. Because in life, we are compensated by our, the value we provide. The more value you create and provide to others, the more rewards you get in life. And you cannot create and provide value if you're focused on yourself, if that's your primary focus. If you're focused on serving and loving, and giving and creating things that will benefit other people, that's value. And the universe or the God or whatever you want to call it provides you back your rewards. 
So connection and love, you know, it's a deeper connection when you're really trying to help people and you really care about them. You know, I hate to think that you guys are sitting there to where a place where I was many years ago and it, it saddens me to know that you're having to go through the struggles. Pain is not fun. We know this, you know, but it makes me happy to know that I can try to convey to you the messages, things that I've learned that could be helpful and that in some of you, if not all of you, there are maybe little light bulbs going off inside of your head and stuff going on inside of your heart that might make you change. Because you have the, the same thing that I have, the same thing we all have. You have a really good, good side and a really bad, bad side. I have it too, a really, really good, good side and a really, really bad, bad side. And the more we overcome our bad, bad side and learn to deal with that and not give in to it, and the more we learn to grow our good side, the things that we're capable of, the more awesome life becomes. And if we learn to use those things in service to others and to create value, life becomes great. We have certainty, we have variety, we have significance. Even though we're not even looking for any of these things, so to speak, we're just trying to focus on giving and serving and making a difference, and all these become ours automatically. Uh, growth, we're growing and learning, and contribution, we're certainly making a huge contribution. And when we do this, I, I just wish I could find a way to, you know, box up what I'm trying to tell you and what I feel and give it to you. You know, you open up the box and you get it. I, I wish that I could do that. But really, it's up to you. It's up to you to be thinking in your mind, all right, does this stuff make sense even a little bit? So this is the foundation of where we got to go. Um, we have human needs we're trying to meet. Our life has been horribly ineffective in the past because we've been trying to meet them in a wrong way. We've been self-focused and just about us, trying to fill our needs. It's, it's childish and it's understandable because it's like when I started out, I was 10 years old. My mom died, for goodness sake. My grandfather blew out his brains while we were visiting. I mean, yeah, stuff happens. Life can be very horrible, but we don't have to be stuck in that mentality. We have to learn more effective ways to live. And I needed to stop hurting. And unfortunately, back then, I didn't have anybody to show me a way to, to stop hurting. And now I know a better way to stop hurting. I know a way to live fully. I know a way to live in serving and value and awesomeness. And you can too. So we've been there, done that. Now it's time to fulfill these needs without trying to fulfill them. And by that is we do that by trying to become the very best we can. Try to overcome the addiction. Start working on the things that you need to do. Do the 12 steps. Do all the things that we're going to talk about in the rest of this video or this series. And then focus on how you can give on a daily basis. What little ways you can serve and help others in a meaningful way. Strive. And learn to just, you know, take rejection. Take, uh, you know, the th bad days when they come up, and we got to deal with those in a more effective way. And I'll be talking more about some tactics for dealing with things as they come up in an effective way uh, as we go along in this series. So I hope this makes sense. Remember, human needs, we're trying to fill. Problem is, trying to fill them in a wrong way. Living the way of get, selfish, self-centered, ineffective. If we want to make a difference, if we want to change, and we want to really maximize our lives and, and make a difference in the world, we got to go to the way of give. It's more effective. It's focused on what we can do to make a difference for others. And it gives us all the things we want and it fulfills all of our needs. All right, in this section, we're going to talk about how long it takes to overcome a bad habit or to develop a new habit. Now, recent research shows that it actually takes about 66 days. They used to say anywhere from 20 to 45 days, but the recent research shows that really it's more like 66 days. And I agree with that. I used to use 45 days as a benchmark of saying it takes 45 days to start grooving in a new habit or start overcoming and getting a good hold on overcoming a bad habit, but it really takes longer to really start really ingraining it. So let's say uh, the 66 days is right, but let's take it a step further and let's say that it actually takes 90 days. What if it took 90 days to overcome a bad habit and to really develop a new 
better good habit. Here's what's up with that. Here's what the deal is. This is a life timeline. It shows an average life of 80 years. 10 years, 20, 30, on up through 80 years. If you live 80 years, and if you're like me, here's just an example, I'm 55. I just turned 55. So I have this year, from 55 to 56, I have 365 days where I could work on four habits this year because there are four 90-day periods in a year. So let's say, for example, I decided to say if I was still using and still smoking, like back in the old days, still had anger problems. If I decided to really take those three things this year and really work on them, number one, I would work on the drugs and alcohol addiction. And if I really worked the program for 90 days, dealt with all my old crud, finally cleaned it out, got rid of all the crap, worked all the 12 steps, and started learning more effective ways to deal with life, and did it every day, for 90 days in a row, I would have a really good foothold on keeping that new habit, especially if I did that effectively. Same with the anger problem. Say I learned new, better ways in the next, the, the next 90 days after that, uh, so I did 90 days really focused on the drug and alcohol, although you're going to continue the new habit forever, but the next 90 days, I work on anger problems, and I learn how to not be angry, how to deal with the old crud, and how to deal with things more effectively where I can have more peace and more happiness in my heart. And then the next 90 days after that, maybe I take a break for 90 days, I'm just working on those two, and then the fourth 90 days of the year I work on quitting smoking. And out of that time I spend 90 days really focused on what's triggering me to smoke and why am I addicted and all those, and I work on cleaning that out and developing new habits that enable me not to smoke. Say if I accomplish that this year, I, for the rest of my life, if I live to 80, that's a lot of years. If I'm 55, say I live to 85, 65, 75, 85, that's 30 years. If I live to uh, 80, that's 25 years of the rest of my life I can live without drugs and alcohol, sucking the life out of me, harming me and others, sabotaging everything I do, uh, live without the anger problems, have new better ways to deal with things where I have more peace in my soul when I feel better and I feel better about life and I'm able to contribute in a better way and without smoking. Just think of all the money I'll save and the health, how I feel better because I'm not doing all that other crap. So for the next 25 years, if I only live to 80, even if I live to uh, 70 or 60, that's many years of living better. That's why it's important to stick with it and do all the things you're supposed to do over the next 90 days to change a habit. And if you do it half-hearted, if you give it half effort, if you don't really go with the whole program, you're probably not going to have much change. You have to go wholehearted for 90 days, just 90 days. Then you've got the rest of your life. 90 days is only one-fourth of a year. That's not long, considering you have a whole lot of life left to live. So what happens if you don't do anything about it, or if you do everything halfway? Here's what happens. Then your life continues to stink. Your life continues to be a battle, continues to be painful, continues to be hard, and you continue to try to escape in those old habits that don't work anymore, and that only cause you more suffering, more pain, for the rest of your life, which will probably, statistics show, be shortened because you have those same old poor behaviors. I want to encourage you to really take this seriously and spend the next 90 days really focusing on what you're trying to overcome right now and focus on clearing out the old ways of doing things, the old cruddy things, the old crap inside of you, and focus on developing the new good habits that will enable you to live better for the rest of your life and hopefully that's a good many years. Okay, as we begin to build our different strategies and different ways of, of looking at life and dealing with life more effectively, the first thing we really need to do now that we understand the way of give and the way of get and the foundation of what works and what doesn't work, that, that's the foundation that we just talked about recently, and the timeline, that you've got time to make significant change, significant improvement 
in your life and you can do it. I know that you can. So here's the thing. You first have to have a vision because you cannot perform beyond how you see yourself. If deep down we see ourselves as losers, as failures, hey, I've always failed. Every time I've tried, I've failed. Every time I've tried to go do this the right way, it hasn't worked. Okay, that's past, doesn't matter. In my mind, there's no failure. There's only feedback. No failure. There's only feedback. If you're getting horrible results with the things that you're doing, that's feedback. That's telling you, this ain't working. This doesn't work. So we have to try something different. And we need a bigger vision for ourselves. what's possible. There's a great spiritual principle that says, where there is no vision, my people perish. And it's the same for us. If we can't see a different outcome, a different vision for ourselves, we perish in our same old stuff. Don't do that. Let's do this, okay? So here is a, a cool thing that I do in business. Not many people know this stuff. So you guys are learning a lot of cool things throughout this video series that other people don't know. We'll probably never know, unfortunately, unless we get it out there for them. But you get to know it and you get to try these things and put them into practice. I do this in business. I set an outcome that I want, a desired outcome, an end result, and then I look at where I'm at today. And as you see, I outcome is the smiley face one. Hey, I want to be happy and have all these cool things. So for us, we're talking about overcoming addiction and living a better life. Outcome is you want to be happy. You want to stay clean and sober because you know if you've accepted it, which is that key foundation, again, once you accept that, man, that is the real problem. i got to stop that. So you want to stay clean and sober. You want to have a job you love. You want to be happy clean and sober. You want to have loving relationships, good relationships, healthy ones. You want to make a difference in life. And whatever else you want, that's the outcome you want. Today, not quite there yet. Today we have challenges, right? We have things that we got to battle through. So we know where we're at. We know we don't want to be there. We know where we want to be. Good start. Now we draw out a map and I would suggest you do this on paper. I do this for anything I'm trying to improve in my life. I'll draw out a map. So the first thing that you would need to do, and this is just my looking at it, you'll want to write down your own things and, and may include all of these or some of these. You want to get to the point where you really admit and accept that you can no longer use without consequences. That is important. You have to get that. That's got to be one of the things you work on. And if you keep asking yourself, how can I get there? What can I do to get there? That's how you find answers. Whenever we start putting a block up in our mind, we go, that won't work for me because it's never worked before, or uh, you know, sure, that's a great idea for you, but not for me, then, then you've already you know, set it up for failure. That's not how you find answers. If I would have gone with all the things that were logical, I would not be where I'm at today. If they would have told me that I could have overcome drugs and alcohol, overcome being a ninth grade dropout, overcome being the dumbest kid in my dad's family and a really poor student, and become an executive for a, a large corporation, manage uh, really uh, awesome people who have college degrees, even master's degrees, be able to do videos for you like this, be able to communicate like this, Man, when I first came off drugs and alcohol, I cussed every other word and said man at the end of each sentence. You know, man, you know, that was my, that's who I was. Time and effort changed that. And so now this is where I'm at. And all the odds were against me. But I, instead of looking at what I can't do, like the 95% again, I looked at what do the 5% do differently. I started doing what the 5% do, and it worked for me too, and it will work for you, and it's worked for others. So let's do, think in a 5% way. How do I get to this point of acceptance and admitting that this is really the stuff that's killing me, okay? Another one is, how can I make sure I work all 12 steps, start working them, start doing them, work all 12 the steps, and do it passionately. Don't do it kind of halfway. Do it really fully. Work those 12 steps and get yourself cleared out. That is a great foundation builder learn new strategies and tactics, which we're, we're talking about throughout all these videos that I'm doing for you. Support group, what meetings can I go to? And I would suggest you go to five AA meetings or some related type of support group for your addiction regularly, five meetings a week for a long time. It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing because it helps you get in the right environment, it helps you clear, it helps you learn, it helps you observe. Observe what people are doing that works and also what they're doing that doesn't work. 
I remember when I was in AA, there was, uh, early on, there was a guy who'd been sober, I think it was five or six years, and to me that seemed like an eternity at the time, and he started using a week before Christmas, and he blew his brains out on Christmas, and he had a family. And it shocked me. I thought, wow, Doug, somebody who's been sober five years, what was he doing? And then I started to find out, you know, he hadn't been happy for a while. And again, that's why I say about happy, clean, and sober. He hadn't really been working the steps. He hadn't been dealing with the problems that came up in his life. He let him build up, and he went back into the old behavior. That's why we got to use tactics for dealing with stuff. And again, in, in a little bit further on in this session or next session, we're going to be talking about how to deal with things more effectively so you can deal with problems as they come up and not let them suck you back into that horrible life. So uh, meetings, very important. Sober friends, people who are sober and uh, also normies. I, I started hanging around with people who did not have alcohol and drug problems. If I could find a normie friend that would take me around and let me hang out with them, that's what I was looking for because I didn't want to hang around uh, people who were using. I couldn't hang around them anymore. And uh, so that's very important. Counselors, organizations that can help you. What companies, what organizations, what people, who can help me on my journey to get to the next level? Uh, books, what books can I read? What audio tapes can I listen to? What stuff can I get? You don't even have to have the money for it yet. Just start planning out who can help you and, and what can happen. And then ask yourself, how can I receive that? How can I get to the point where I can have those resources so I can improve myself and benefit others. And, and the way will come to you. And there is a higher power in my belief system that will help you. Well, I know that's, I, I have so much evidence in my own life of how I've been helped to receive things beyond whatever thought was possible. This is an important concept. Um, another thing is to identify potential obstacles. What are the things that could prevent me from reaching my goal of being happy, clean, and sober, and all these things. What are potential obstacles? Well, going to a bar, probably a bad idea, right? So that's an obstacle. How do I keep myself away from there? Friends are going to try to contact me. They're going to go, hey, man, what you been up to? Oh, you're clean and sober. Wow, huh? how's that working for you? And if you're having a bad day, you might be going, well, I'm having a bad day, and they can suck you into it. Identify these situations and things that could cause you to go back. Oh, if you get too bored, if you get too hungry, too angry, lonely, or tired, identify as many things as you can that would cause you a problem, and then figure out options for handling those situations. What would be a better way? Rather than if some of my friends are calling me and saying, hey, man, what you doing? And I'm having a bad day, and they're my old friends, and they're talking about going using, what is a better option? Better option would be, look, I got to go. I can't talk to you right now. Hang up call a sponsor, go to a meeting, write it out. Write down what your options are because if you write out, how can I handle these situations, as many as you can think of, how can I handle them in a better way, then when those situations come up, it will pop into your mind these things you've written down, these options, rather than you facing it cold, being unprepared, and getting sucked into it. This is important stuff. Write down those potential obstacles and ways around and then also have a daily plan which we're going to talk about next so have a daily plan of action things disciplines that you do every day that help you stay as on keel and on track as possible and as you do these things the longer you do them the more your life becomes all the things that you want so first thing have a long-term vision a long-term plan in the next section we're going to talk about some short-term daily things that you can do to make yourself uh, do what you need to do to make yourself stay on track. Okay, in this section we're going to pull together everything we've learned about relapse prevention and about recovery in this series. So it all boils down to having a daily plan, a strategy for how you're going to approach each day and then making that a habit, doing it over time as we talked about uh, the more days that you do it, it becomes a habit, especially if you follow the 66 or 90 day habit rule. After you've done it so many times, it becomes just a way of life, and then the rest of your life becomes awesome. So here's the, how we look at a daily plan. There's really two aspects to it. There's a daily series of rituals. That means daily things that you will not compromise on, things that you will do, have to do every day. and in this category of rituals, I, I put down some examples, some things that I would do or things that I already practice in my life. 
and that is number one is surrender ego so whether you have a higher power or not yet uh, it's great to set aside the human ego because that's what gets us in trouble when we think we know better when we think we have all the answers when we think we're all that and more we have a problem because the fact is we have issues, especially if we're trying to recover from addiction or overcome a problem in our lives. We are not all powerful, and that's why we're having problems. So surrender the human ego. I do it in the form of surrendering to my higher power. I surrender to God or my higher power, and I say, hey, um, you know, I want to go through this day in an optimal way. Please take my will, my ego out of the way. Help me to be surrendered and yielded to you in the best way possible and to be pure of heart and sincere and pure of mind and help me strive to do the very best I can do today to be of maximum service to you and to other people. And please turn on all my skills, the best skills I have for serving everyone around me. And so I pray something along those lines pretty much every day. When I'm surrendered and when I start my day with that mindset of being surrendered to just be of service and to get out of the way and have the higher power or higher principles work through me, help have God work through me, then my life gets better. And don't get hung up on the word God or higher power or any of that. Just surrender your human ego, your negative crap, to something else. Just try it. And do that every day and you'll find out that over a few days you'll find out it has some pretty cool effects. So number one, every day, surrender. Uh, for me, a second thing I'd like to do regularly and almost every day is to do a clearing. And so I clear out my mental and emotional clutter. And one easy way to do that is to set a timer for 15 minutes and write down everything that's going through your mind for 15 minutes. All the things that you're worried about, all the things that you are angry about, all the things you are afraid about, all the things you are sad about, write it all out and get it out of your system. Write it and write it and write it. And if you're like most people, the first time you do this, you could go way longer than 15 minutes and, and if that's what you want to do, do that. But once you get doing it regularly, it comes hard to really do it for 15 minutes because you're, you don't have so much clutter. But write down everything that's going on with you for 15 minutes and then when you get to the end of it, you look at, read through everything that you've written down and you'll find out that about 90% of it you can do nothing about. It has something you have no control over, so you cross a line through those items that you can do nothing about and you surrender it to the universe, to God, to the higher power, but surrender it to something outside of yourself and just say, hey, I can't do anything about this, so I'm letting it go. Let it go. Get it out of your mind, get it out of your emotions. Because all that clutter running around reaps havoc on our emotions and our mentality and it just causes grief. Get rid of it. You don't need it. Just get rid of it. So that's what I do for clearing. Then three, the third thing that's really important for me is to energize. And what, you know, people have different ways of doing that, but if I was... Uh, still early on in AA for, you know, I, I put a, going to meetings, AA meetings would be at the very top of that list. Um, other things I do is I read a lot of uh, positive attitude materials or I watch uh, videos on YouTube about positive mindset and having a right attitude and I watch stories about other people who've had tragedies and learned to succeed beyond those tragedies and I it motivates me, it inspires me. So do something that energizes and inspires you in a positive way. That's the third thing I would consider a must. And these are really practices that I do pretty much daily in my life today. The fourth one is another very important one, it's visioning. And we kind of talked about it in, in a previous section about it, where there is no vision, my people perish. If you don't have a vision for your life, if you don't see yourself in a better position than you are now, it's hard to get there if you don't really see yourself beyond where you are at now. So what I do for that is I, before I go to sleep and when I wake up in the morning, I close my eyes for a few minutes and I think about what it would be like to live in the ideal state. What would it be like, if I was in your shoes, I'd be thinking, what would it be like to live happy and free without using drugs and alcohol, without smoking, whatever the problem I'd be going through, what it would be like to experience that life without that and how awesome that would be. 
how great that would be. And just vision and enjoy that experience of already being in the, the ultimate goal I want to be at. Envision being in it right now as if it's already real. And I envision that, and that's how I start my day, and that's how I go to bed at night. And that just really uh, keeps you in the right mindset. And then the final thing is, uh, for you guys especially, work on something of the 12 steps. Um, for me, I, if you notice, surrendering is actually one of the 12 steps. Energizing, going to meetings or serving others is one way I energize is by doing things for others. So they're part of the 12 steps, but I'm saying specifically work on, you know, go through all the 12 steps. That's something that's really important at the stage you guys are in and, and for years. I mean, for the first seven years, I went to tons of meetings and I went and did the steps over and over again meticulously. Uh, but nowadays, they're just incorporated into my life. So that's what I call your daily rituals. So you'd have these things, these core elements every day. And so if you have to spend just 30 minutes a day or an hour a day, it will make the remaining 23 hours a day great. And so you have to do this to start developing a habit of dealing with life in a better way and making yourself a better person. So those are the rituals part. The second part of the daily plan is the tactics part. And that is when we're talking about certain triggers, things come up and happen in your life that trigger you to want to go back to an old behavior. And you may, for example, I may have used this before, but if uh, one of your old friends calls you and says, hey, uh, you know, what are you doing? You want to come out with us tonight? We're going to the bar. And uh, you can't do that anymore. That's not something that if you want to stay straight, that isn't going to work. And so if that happens, you're going to do what? You have to write down what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell them, man, I don't drink anymore. I appreciate the offer. I'm not going to hang with you guys. I just can't for my own good. And if you're a real friend, you're going to wish me well and, and want me to do what's best for me. And if they get ticked off at you, then they're not real friends. I lost several so-called friends that way. Those people are either dead now in prison or uh, just living a horrible life. And so you have to have these things planned out. So if, uh, here's another one, if I have the urge to use, just out of the blue, I have the urge to go drink or drug, then what do I do? I'm gonna call my sponsor, I'm gonna get up and physically start doing some activity around my house, cleaning my house or something to get my mind off of it, instantly. So you write down all as many things as you can think about, if this happens, I will do this, and read it every day so that you, when you get up in the morning and you do your regular rituals, you can read through your tactics so they're fresh in your mind. So that as things come up, you do a plan of action that's positive and powerful. And then if you, you know, think of a new one, if a new one happens, a new trigger hits you one day, then you write down, okay, when this or if this happens, then I'm going to do this. And you have a counteraction that's positive and good. And so then through the course of 66 days or 90 days of doing these things, they become more ingrained into you and more easy for you to continue. And this greatly increases your chances of success at overcoming your challenges today. So I hope this all makes sense and it's simple. It's not hard and people always think, well, we have to do that. Well, you, you have to do a lot of things uh, every day. You have to brush your teeth, you have to take a shower, you have to make your bed or whatever the things are you do in your life. They're, they just become nothing after a while because uh, you know they're habits. And so when you do these things, you become an optimal person. You become an optimal person because you practice daily principles that make you seem almost superhuman to other people because you have a great disposition, you're positive, you're energized, you're helping others, you're doing things that are good and healthy, and you're not wrecking your life, and you're not wrecking other people's lives, and you're learning how to deal with things powerful. And in this case, you're learning how to deal with situations as they come up in a very powerful way. Hope this has been helpful. If you will do these things, your life will get extraordinarily better much better than you could ever imagine right now. I wish you the best. I wish you all the success and happiness in the world. It's been my pleasure to share this information with you. And sincerely, I wish you the best.